Well, joining me now live from Washington is author and historian Dr. Webster Griffin Tarpley. With us live from London, member of the Syrian Social Club, Mr. Haytham al Sebahi, and also via Skype from Madison, founding member of the Muslim Jewish Christian Alliance, Mr. Kevin Barrett. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. My first question to Mr. al Sebahi in London. Uh, Mr. al Sebahi, the mainstream media are calling them rebels seeking to topple Bashar al-Assad. The question that I want to put to you first is who do you think these rebels are? Where are they getting their weapons from and why have they chosen to violate the truce? Well, uh, I mean, this is so-called rebels. They are a mixture of a different terrorist group. They are the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, plus some from Al-Qaeda, uh, plus some uh, fundamental Islamists from North Lebanon uh, backed with some Wahhabis and some Salafis. Uh, these people, they got the arms through the north of Lebanon. Uh, there is another element in Libya, in Tunisia, supplied arms to northern, uh, to south of Turkey and they were smuggling the arms through the, that border to Syria. They want to stabilize the situation. This, is, th this type of a group, is, they don't have one uh, command center. They are not controlled by uh, so-called any organization. They are splinter groups. They are just there to cause destruction, to kill, maim, and uh, actually break the Syrian, what you call the infrastructure. Uh, this, the, this, this type of group, they thrive on those type of operations and uh, they just push for chaos in the country. Right. Well, Dr. Tarpley, if, let's put this question to you as well. I guess they're in London saying these are splinter groups not necessarily being commanded from a central centre. Do you think that these are groups that are, we could uh, call them the arms uh, of uh, some, some other rather uh, state, some other politicians deciding what they should do in uh, Syria? W how would you describe them? I think there is a significant degree of centralization in, in the following sense. Uh, it's the NATO states plus the reactionary feudal monarchies of the Gulf, the Qatar, Saudi Arabia, uh, and others. Uh, and the history of this, I think, is, is interesting. You're dealing with death squads. They are indeed terrorists, but they're uh, the, the kernel, the, the hard core, the main force of what's causing the trouble in Syria are these death squads and where did they come from? Back in 2006-2007, the U.S. forces in Iraq found that their situation was almost untenable and uh, Ambassador John Negroponte was brought in after a career in Central America and Latin America. Uh, he was found that wherever Negroponte showed up in, in Central America and Salvador, that death squads would appear and begin essentially targeting uh, population groups that the U.S. wanted to, to, to attack or wipe out. And sure enough, that is what happened in Iraq around 2007. Negroponte arrived, death squads appeared. Now, the death squads in this case were Sunni extremist fanatics drawn from many, many areas, drawn from Saudi Arabia, from faraway points in the world. They began killing Shiites in particular in, in Iraq, and that is what led to the civil war in Iraq in, the, in, the, in those years, 2007-2008. That is what allowed the United States to, to maintain a presence in Iraq. Now, at the time that Negroponte did this, he was working with a man named Robert Ford. It was his, his right-hand man. And sure enough, uh, Robert Ford then showed up in Damascus as the UN, United States ambassador. I would add that in 2007-2008, the original death squad plan, known as the Salvadoran option, included Syria. Syria was regarded as a unit with, with Iraq, and it, so what they were doing is setting the, uh, the basis at that time. They merely needed to develop it further. So I think you've got debt squads in the center of it, and then, of course, they're joined by indigenous fanatics, indigenous criminal elements, and then there is a thin veneer of civilians who are interested in 
uh, political reform. The thing is that they get lost in the shuffle. My right. own visit to uh, Homs and, and Banyas last year, this was a, never a peaceful rebellion. It was always armed. It was always based on killing, and it, it was right. So, Dr. Tarpley, what you're suggesting is that Assad. this this is a prelude to civil war, you say, and this could lead to a military intervention. But before we continue with that discussion, uh, I'd also bring, like to bring in Dr. Kevin Barrett on this. Uh, Dr. Barrett, until recently, uh, when the armed groups did attack government targets and planted bombs, according to the Syrian uh, regime, the mainstream media would accuse the government itself of being behind these attacks uh, and rejected any responsibility by the armed groups. But this has changed uh, since a few days ago. For example, news outlets reported that armed opposition groups were responsible for the attacks on Tuesday that killed several people. Uh, do you think there's a reason for this change? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. It's another example of people like Webster Tarpley being far, far ahead of the mainstream media. Uh, he was actually there in Syria reporting that these groups were attacking civilians and uh, committing terrorism, basically, firing on people from rooftops and so on, and that the whole situation was being misreported by the mainstream media and by Al Jazeera and so on. So I, I think it may be a case of the uh, mainstream media finally being uh, caught up with by reality. That is, it, at, some point, at some point they're overtaken by reality and they can't continue to try to report it as if only one side is doing all the fighting when in fact it's the other side that's the uh, instigator of the armed clashes. So uh, I, I'm glad to see that the media is finally reporting the fact that there are these uh, terrorists destabilizing Syria, and they're there on a mission from NATO and, and from the U.S., and as Webster said, they're, they're there uh, probably as a sort of outgrowth of what happened in Iraq under Negroponte. But I don't expect that the mainstream media is going to fill in the details and paint the kind of picture that would allow people to actually understand what's going on. Hmm. Uh, we do have to add that I think that the civilians desiring reform in Syria are perhaps a more significant factor than, uh, than Webster Tarpley uh, has, has said. I think that there is a, a need for democratic reform in Syria, but it needs to be peaceful, it needs to be gradual, it needs to be done in uh, cooperation right. with the current government, not by uh, this kind of overthrowing the government through blood and mayhem, which is the destabilization strategy that's being deployed by the U.S. and NATO. Well, basically, the peace plan that's been proposed by Kofi Annan is about uh, bringing this uh, development to Syria in a peaceful way, isn't it? But at the same time, Mr. al-Sabahi, the Syrian government has been accused of killing more than 30 people on Monday in Hama. So who can say, basically, which side is breaking the truce now and which side isn't? We know the stronghold of these terrorists are uh, the area from Homs to Hama to south of Idlib. As, as Idlib is clear now, Hama and Homs has a route to the north of Lebanon. And there is some elements of this terrorist, they're still mangling around that area. So from time to time, they, they come and they attack the checkpoints, some uh, government installation, uh, I mean the checkpoints also where the army is, and the, the army uh, retaliating. And actually the security service look into these people because to, to this type of, of uh, attacking uh, groups, because the, the, these uh, groups they, are, they don't belong to anybody. This group, they've just been infiltrated. They are infiltrated by some uh, Saudi intelligence. They're, they're infiltrated by the CIA. And they are used to, to just uh, uh, to damage the agreement. They don't want, of course, to the Kofi Annan uh, plan to go ahead because it's, it's not in, in their favor. They, they are at the moment they changing tactics. They are trading in uh, what we call a human body parts. They are using child soldiers. Actually, also they're using, uh, I mean, uh, is a really a shame to you they're using handicaps and people with learning difficulties they give them a box they send them towards the army checkpoints and they blow them out uh, by remote controls 
the, the, this, this type of groups, they thrive on chaos. They are not controlled. Right. So the Syrian security service and the army, has, they have no, I mean, another option to look for these people and, and to fight them back and to clear them from those areas. Right. So well, most of these people who die uh, fr from the, this type of group, they are on exchanges with the army. Right. If we go ahead with the, the government's claim uh, and also the analysis that we're hearing that these groups are after preventing this peace plan from working, Dr. Tarpley, who is going to benefit uh, from the peace plan not working? Uh, if we say that countries like Saudi Arabia, like Qatar, Turkey, what the government in Syria says are the ones that are preventing this violence, what kind of a solution are they looking for then? And uh, how would they benefit uh, from something, uh, from rather uh, n the peace plan not working? Well, the, the U.S. and NATO goal, the U.S., the British, the French, NATO, it is regime change uh, through some kind of coalition of the willing assuming that they can't get their plan rammed through the UN Security Council uh, because of the veto of Russia and, and of China. Um, I think you can also see in the Security Council in the last couple of meetings, there's a clear division that Russia and China really would like this plan for observers to work in the sense of lowering the level of violence and uh, pacifying uh, the country. Um, Certainly, there is, a, there is a civilian opposition to the Ba'ath Party, and many of them that I met are actually in dialogue with the Ba'ath Party. They, uh, they um, engage in the, uh, the political process that has been provided, and indeed, we're, we're going towards elections at the present time. The, the goal, however, if you look at Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, Alain Juppé, the last couple of days, they obviously don't want the observer mission to work in that sense. Now, I've been skeptical about the observers. Uh, however, we must concede to the Russians that there has, it has had some effect. Uh, naturally, the Western media still have all their articles. Activists say, activists claim, this means the Syrian observatory in London, which is a gaggle of uh, Syrian expatriates of the Rifat Assad clique. Uh, then there's the coordination, there's the Gouperin Khadam, in Paris, so they all they compete with uh, extravagant claims of of deaths and so forth. Um, we ought to hear what these observers have to say, but of course we've got to watch out where did these observers come from. Uh, I'm not reassured by the fact that the head of the observer team is a NATO general by the name of Mood or Mode M O O D from Norway. That doesn't seem to be a very good choice. He's not likely to be very even-handed. The other problem you have is that Ban Ki Moon and um, the, the political chief of the United Nations, B. Lynn Pasco, the political commissar of this mission, along with Navi Pillai, right. they have discredited themselves. Those are not international civil servants. They're not even-handed. They're not honest brokers. These are people who are looking for jobs, I would say, in you know, U.S.-based multinational corporations at, right. some, at some future point. But so let's, there is if a I chance for this to, to work. Yeah, but if the I one ingredient stop that you, you need there. to do is to have... The question of the death squads brought up. Mm. Right. I'd just like to go back to Dr. Barrett here and have his view. Dr. Barrett, will the truce hold for any longer, looking at the situation we are right now? And what's going to happen if it doesn't? Now, the West has called this the last effort to prevent Syria from falling into civil war. Is Syria going to collapse into civil war? I hope not, but I, I honestly think that's probably what the Western powers that are acting there want. The, this is part of a larger strategy to destroy the Islamic world by fostering sectarian tensions and destabilizing number 11, 2001, when this war on Islam went into high gear. Uh, and unfortunately, many of the world's Muslims are playing along with this. Uh, it's really unfortunate that groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, which have an honorable history in some areas at least, uh, have fallen into this trap of uh, these sectarian uh, destabilization operations. We've seen this in Libya, we've seen it in Iraq, and now we're seeing it in Syria. Uh, it, at this point, it's, it's just really sad to see the way that the Western powers claim to be after peace and human rights, when in fact they're operating in this long-term uh, struggle to 
destroy uh, the power of the Islamic world by breaking it up into tiny pieces. And of course, the primary beneficiaries of this are intended to be the Zionists, who will not have any, any significant opposition once the Middle East has been fragmented into tiny uh, fight, uh, competing uh, fr uh, fragments. So I really call on the world's Muslims to wake up and to realize that we need to solve these problems peacefully and in cooperation with our fellow, fellow Muslims. Right. And one way to, to tackle this peacefully, Russia and China, as well as Kofi Annan, uh, have been saying, Mr. Al-Sabahi, is the option of dialogue negotiation between the opposition, they say, and uh, the government. But who are these op opposition? Is there a united opposition? And does the opposition inside Syria share the same stance, for instance, uh, of the opposition abroad? We've been seeing parts of the opposition calling, for, for instance, for outside military intervention. So uh, what do you think about this? Well, there is two types of opposition. There is opposition, which we call them, though, I mean, uh, normal opposition inside Syria. Some of them is outside. But we are not talking here about the delusional council, the, the SMP. The, these people who have been calling day by day to, uh, for NATO to attack Syria, for uh, interference from, NA from outside forces, these people now have no place. And we can see, th see them actually, they just uh, went to the side. Now, now there, is, there is a situation in Syria and there is two parts to that situation. One, one, one is there is what so-called some of the international community like United States, France, Britain, other countries who they are negotiating some condition uh, after they lost on the ground. And there is the other part of it, the, this uncontrolled terrorist. I might, I, please, I want to come to one point about the civil war and the sectarian uh, fights in Syria. There is two sides there to this. There is the terrorist side who is killing, maiming, blowing, uh, using all, all of the horrible tactics. And there is one side who they are pro-government. I am one, I am a Syrian citizen and I am a pro-government and I would like to see reform. But we will not and we will not pick up arm to fight anybody. As a citizen, we, ha we depend on our army, we depend on our security service, and we depend on our government to deal with it. We will not become arms, we will not fight. So there will not be a sectarian war, and there will not be a civil war. There is two sides, there is a legitimate government with its army and its security forces, and there is a terrorist b backed by countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United States, Britain, France, and Turkey, and fundamentalists behind it. Our government has to deal with the other international uh, other side of the international community like Russia and China and other with this type right. of, uh, of uh, people. On the ground uh, we give a hundred percent assurance and we give a trust to our army to our security to deal with it and wh when our army has attacked it has to attack back and a violent will, made by, will, will be made by violence. Right, before there, we run out there's of no time. no question about that. Thank you very much, Mr. Al-Sabahi. Dr. Tarpley, quickly, if you can, uh, I'd like to have your opinion on the basic and uh, the main question here, which is, will the Syrian crisis end without military intervention? Can the Syrian crisis end uh, without uh, President Bashar al-Assad stepping down? What do you think? I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a grave danger. Uh, right now, there is an attempt by the NATO powers to create a civil war from the outside. I don't think they have the wherewithal for a civil war, as we just heard eloquently stated, uh, but they will try. Let's look for a second at the former colonial power, always a good place to look in these situations. That would be France. They ran Syria well into the 1940s. Uh, could they do something? If we look at uh, Paris today, we see the most pro-NATO president of France that we've had in recent years, Sarkozy. He just lost the first round. He's fighting for his political life. Some would say this is a situation made to order for a wag the dog event. Some kind of provocation, some stunt, some false flag event that will be blamed on the Assad government, despite the fact it comes from 
circles much closer to NATO in Brussels and use that for the armed intervention because the NATO hopes for Syria come down to armed intervention using some pretext, either humanitarian or terrorist. And the goal, of course, as has been said, to deprive Iran of an ally and to deprive Hezbollah of their strategic uh, depth and, and thereby uh, weaken the, the independent states of the, of the Middle East. Thank you very much, Dr. Webster Griffin Tarpley, joining me there live from Washington, an author and historian. I'd also like to give our thanks to our guest in London, member of the Syrian Social Club, Dr. Haytham al Sebahi, and also joining us via Skype and on the line from Madison, founding member of the Muslim Jewish Christian Alliance, Dr. Kevin Barrett. Thank you very much for staying with us, viewers, from Mihoma Lesgi and the rest of the team here in Tehran. Until our next program, it's goodbye.